Well, I want to get to it because I know you're a, a working stiff. Am I right? Are you still with uh, The Late Late Show? Still a uh, head writer on The Late Late Show. We wrapped up like 20 minutes ago. I took a quick shower because why do that in the morning? Time doesn't mean anything. So uh, Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? this? This is like third Saturday, right? I, I think that's what Monday's called now. It's third Saturday. It's also the eighth Wednesday in a row. It's, I mean, it's everything. So tell me a little bit about, tell us how that works. Uh, I'm assuming you're zooming into a room to uh, do the writing. Is that right? Yeah. So they built a little studio in James's garage. Yeah, I saw that. It's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. We saw the other shows doing where it was like, you know, you'd have Kimmel like on his couch or like, you know, like Seth or like Fallon like on his front porch. And we were like, that's that's awesome. They can do that, but our show is so glossy that it's going to be weird if we go from like this like bright shiny show that does carpool karaoke to like right. James growing a beard in his kitchen. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been the writing process has been really interesting. It's less room than we used to do because you know you traditionally we would sit around like a writer's table a lot of the time and bat ideas around, and we still have those meetings like three times a week, but. Right now, it's a lot of getting assignments and then going off on your own and like writing stuff up. It's a lot of writing in Google Docs right now. How how big is your staff currently? We have uh, ten writers, not including myself and the other head writer. So as a as a as a room right now, just in this new uh, you know COVID world. So you're you're meeting a couple of times a week. You bat around ideas and then you assign them out to writers. They cut out. They come up with their stuff, and and then how does it work from there? Does it go to, back to you, and then you send it on to James, or what? Yeah, so they, uh, when, when they get their assignment, they do it, and then they'll send it to the other head writer and I, and then the two of us and one of our uh, producers will go through those ideas, decide if there's anything that, like, isn't right, or uh, if jokes need to get switched out, or if, like, a casting thing needs to be different. And then we'll send it back to the writers to fix that. And then every morning, and this is true whether we're in this like new world or not, we have something called a creative meeting where, and this is not true of every late night show. This is one where James Gordon is still, like, I mean, we're five years into it and he's still like incredibly hands-on, which is really, really nice. You know, Letterman at the end of the Letterman run was like, I knew people who worked at Letterman who never met David Letterman. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think those people get to that point, but Gordon, we're still every morning, anything that's going to be on the show, we're reading directly to him and he's giving real time feedback on, which is really, really helpful because uh, that's one of the most, I mean, at least in late night, and I think this is probably true in scripted as well. Um, you have to be able to take feedback if you're not the head of the spear, you know, like, right. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it's very, I mean, it's, it's very important to stick to your guns and like, fight for things you believe in like that is also a very important thing and i think people if uh, like showrunners and and talent if they're good want people who are going to stick to their guns and fight for stuff they think is funny that's a big reason you are there is to is to try to make the thing better and if you're passionate about an idea you know at least on our show if you're really passionate it's something Gordon will at least try he'll at least try it which is really nice but wow. yeah, go on. If they're adamant, it's like take the feedback, take yeah. the notes, and, right. and and go implement them. It's a very important skill. You can't like you lose your ego pretty quick. Otherwise, it'll kill you. Right now, uh, now ten around a table that uh, <laughs> that's going to take some time to get everybody's input. I mean, how do you handle that? It's usually so you you know the writer who takes on a bit. So like. Um, we have a thing on our show called like Crosswalk the Musical, which is where right. we do like a musical in, like, in an active crosswalk. Um, and if we're taking that into James that day, um, I write it along with one other person. We're the people who are going to be talking to him and pitching it to him. He's going to give the feedback to us. If another writer has like a really good idea for it, they'll say something. But oftentimes we're not getting pitches from anybody else. It's, it's often like, this is my bit. And, and it's not a sense of ownership. It's not one of those like SNL right, level right, right, like right. paranoia or like a, you know like I'm yeah, afraid get, to get, get, get put on get put on the schedule or die. It's not that right. Exactly. Um, it's it's just more of a 
you're so close and work so you know, so familiar with a bit that you tend to know it better. But if people have ideas, we encourage them to toss it out. It's just oftentimes they don't. And every creative meeting will have, you know, four or five ideas in it. So so they don't drag on for too long. They usually last between like half an hour and forty five minutes. And we're half the size of the uh, of the bigger late night shows. Colbert and Fallon, Kimmel, those are all like twenty person staffs. Really? Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's shocking to me. It's wild. I'm used to rooms of like eight. You know, eight is big in nowadays. Yeah. Um, so d do you have to deal with a network liaison or are you guys pretty much left alone? We do. We have a network liaison, but he's the most uninvolved network liaison. Like, he's involved. Uh, his name's Nick Bernstein. He came up on Conan and uh, worked on The Tonight Show as well. He's really talented, really funny guy. Um, but he kind of stays out of it. He, the only like areas he jumps in, one big part of making TV now, at least late night TV, and I think this is also true, it's creeping into scripted, is like, you're gonna end up doing a lot of branded content. Everything is cyclical. It's like when TV was born, it was like the Colgate Comedy Hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Where, you know it was like a show put on by the Colgate Toothpaste Company. And now we have a Heineken 0.0, .0 themed bar on our show. Wow. We do integrations with Starbucks and they pay us directly. Um, so he, the only times he really gets involved is like, this is going to piss off the sponsors, like that kind of thing. Ah, that's interesting. It, you know, that, yeah. used to, that used to be the purview of the prop guy. You know, he tried to sneak in the Winston packet because yeah. he was getting paid off by Winston. But that's interesting. Now it's coming from the top. It's coming from the, yeah, all the way top. I mean, I guess that's probably one of the things that happens when like, I mean, every network is now owned by a much larger conglomerate, and then that conglomerate's owned by an even larger conglomerate. But it's also because, like, so many things are, that are watched now, like, are watched on YouTube or people skip past the commercials. So, like, in order to keep a 10-person writing staff, you have to kind of go get money wherever you can. And for yeah. us, like, doing bits with Starbucks or with Heineken or whatever. Right, right. Um, now... For late night, it is mostly segment writing. Is that right? You guys are coming up with bits for either established segments or you're coming up with new segments. Yeah, um, ex exactly. So there's, um, on our show, on every late night show, you have like your desk bits. This is stuff like Fallon's thank you notes. Right. Or like on our show, something like Honest Headlines. Uh, Carson would have been like the Karnak thing. You know what I mean? It's stuff yeah, he does yeah, from yeah. the desk that you can do like once a month. Some shows, Fallon does thank you notes once a week. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's something funny that kind of eats up the calendar. On our show, we try to do a lot of sketches with our talent, I think more so than any other late night show. So a big part of, our, of what our staff does is we do the refillables. We have a few of those for sure, the segments. Um, we have a monologue every day. Although now that we're in quarantine, we're doing a thing called like three things to cheer you up. Right, right which is like a very, you know, we try to be funny, but it's like very much a schmaltzy. Yeah. Like, oh, look at this. He's a penguin who became friends with like a, with a rooster. Can you believe it? Uh, I tell you, I, I teared up on the uh, treadmill today when I saw the dog with teeth. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> I, I shed a tear that was- Ruthie Thomas, yeah. We, <laughs> there was a dog that like got a hold of a pair of his owner's novelty teeth. And there's this like little schnauzer running around with like a full set of like, Chris Pine, gorgeous teeth. It's hilarious. It was good. Um, but yeah, so like, and, and that we're only doing that because there's no, you can't really do a monologue without laughing and we're stuck in his garage. Right. It would be, people would tell if we did a laugh track, you know what I mean? They'd be like, those people aren't socially distancing. There's not like a socially distanced laugh track we could run. What, uh, are you, what are you being told as far as when you think you'll get back in a studio? Are you, are you being told anything? We have no idea. It's all, it's, I mean, right now we're all kind of at the whim of like the mayor of New York or the mayor of uh, Los Angeles and the right. governor of California as far as like when we can gather. Uh, our plan is to get back into the studio as soon as possible with no audience. Right. I so see. we can hire our camera guys back. Um, is that a dead camera? Just a, just a locked off camera in James's garage? There are three locked off cameras because he can't be in there with anyone else legally right, right. now. I want to go to the origin story here because, you know, I have sources at Westview High School. 
Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> I consulted them today, and I found out some interesting things that I want you to confirm or deny. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, one, of, <laughs> one of them is that uh, I talked to CJ, who's the, still the drama teacher there. Yeah. And I said, were you there when he went through? And she said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, did he take any classes with you? And she said, no. He knew people in the department. CJ's the acting teacher there. But uh, he was a football guy. Is that right? Were you a, a, an athlete in high school? I was, well, I played football. I don't know if I'd call me an athlete. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I was like, I had both the blessing and the curse of being like six foot three, 320 pounds from like seventh grade. I got like oh, wow. really big, really fast. Um, so football was kind of like a uh, reason for me to do that. I really enjoyed football and I had a good time in high school, which I know is not like typical of any, uh, anyone who gets into like any kind of art form. Right. Or comedy. Um, I still had like things that I hated, obviously, but like I had, I had a good time and I had my friends who weren't football players, but I still had friends. And, had, uh, I, yeah, I never, sorry, go ahead. Go on. You, you never, I never did. I, I tried to get into speech and debate. This is weird. So like I tried to do all the other stuff I could. I, tr I went to the speech and debate teacher and, uh, it, well, I went to my football coach first and I was like, Hey, I'm really interested in like speech and debate and like maybe performing and stuff like that. It would mean me missing parts of practice. Are you okay with that? And my football coach was like, yeah, that would be okay. That's all right. You know, you got to do what you want to do. That's a test to testament to your football skills, right? Like, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then I went to the speech and debate teacher and I was like, Hey, I'm not going to be able to be here like for everything, but I'm going to really try to commit to it. And I'm just really interested. Would it be, would that be okay? And the speech and debate teacher turned me down. Wow, that's a, Fox of Westview. Yeah, that's interesting. That's it's usually the other way around. It's usually a coach that won't budge. Right, we yeah. were so bad at football that it was the uh, really talented speech and debate people who were like turning us down. Go Wildcats! <laughs> so, see, so um, did you not want to like tr audition for any of the shows? I mean, I'm interested in why you didn't want to go on stage. You, uh, CJ said you were really interested in film studies. Is that right? Uh, I did. Yeah, media um, studies. Definitely, definitely like in media stuff. And I was like, we had a school radio station that I like hosted a show on. Okay. Okay. That, fun, but there, we, there we go. Yeah. So I'm trying, what I'm trying to get at is what, what was the thing that said, uh, and did it start in high school? Did the germ start of, Hey, you know, I want to tell jokes for a living. I want to yeah. get, I want to write. I want to get up in front of people. Were you always like the funny guy or what, what I, was it for you in high school? I was usually, I was like a funny guy in class all the time, but it honestly never occurred to me as something one could do for a living. I had no idea. I remember like, I mean, just, I never, it never even like, I listened to stand-up comedy all the time as a kid, you know, from like, I read every one of uh, George Carlin's books. I listened to like Dave Chappelle and like Eddie Izzard and, you know, when I found out like who Maria Bamford was, started listening to like all this, all the comedy I could, and it never occurred to me that it was even something you could do. I had no idea. So when I, did that when did that happen for you? It obviously, when you got out of high school, did you go to university or what? What happened? I went to Southern Oregon for a year because uh, all my friends were going there, and then I missed Portland so much that I transferred to Portland State, and it was at Portland State University. I needed an arts credit to graduate. I was a political science major. And uh, there was a man named Scott Parker who was a professor there who taught uh, some theater classes and also taught improv at Portland State. He's my uncle, so I took his class and the first day within like 10 minutes fell in love with it. And I could tell a much longer version of the story, but like basically I loved improv so much that I dropped out of Portland State, uh, moved down to Los Angeles to study with the Groundlings took their first two classes and then it was like a year to get to the third level. So I moved back to Portland, knew that I now like, I was like, oh, I had a thing I loved and a thing I knew I wanted to do. Uh, took like screenwriting classes, took drama classes at Portland State, graduated and kind of got frustrated with doing improv because it was like, I know that I want to do this for a living. Everyone else in these classes is like, I'm going to be a nurse or an architect and I do this because it's kind of fun on a Wednesday. Right. I, I want to rehearse eight times a week. Uh, so stand up let me kind of dictate how hard I got to work. So I started doing that, enjoyed it more. And uh, were you doing it? Were you doing it locally in LA and the clubs there? Or what was your deal? 
I never did stand up in the first time I lived in LA. I didn't really start doing it earnestly until I got to Port, came back to Portland and um, started when I was about 20. This is my 10th year. I started when I was like 25 doing stand up. And you start, uh, so you started in town here? In Portland. And it was at the beginning of like Portland starting to have kind of a bigger comedy scene. Like when I started, there was this guy, Ron Funches, who was doing it, who's gone on to have like kind of a biggest comedy career. This guy, Shane Torres, who's gone on to have, you know, like his own Comedy Central uh, half hour. And like we were, Shane Torres was my roommate. Ron Funches was like a guy who I drove to gigs and like, you know, still two of my best friends. And like, uh, I was lucky enough with the Bridgetown Comedy Festival coming into town and Helium Comedy Club opening. Uh, and they were bringing in like really good comedians who were of interest to me. Uh, so I sort of got to be lucky enough to sort of help build that wave, but also help ride the wave that other people were building at the same time. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, so you, you, you would say probably that your improv training gave you the, you know, the balls to stand up and do this. Cause I don't understand how you guys do this. It's a terrifying idea to me, you know, I can yeah. sit at the desk, but around a table, but to get up in front of people, and be that vulnerable. Is it the improv thing? Improv certainly helped the first time I got up on stage. You know, improv is a great way to break into it because you're not alone up there. You have people who are on your team helping you out, you know? Right, right. So it's a great way to, like, if you have nerves about being on stage to sort of shake them off. I also like, with stand-up, it's, it's like a cilantro thing, you know what I mean? Like some people taste soap when they eat cilantro, some people think it's delicious. And stand up with me, it was like, I got up there and I was like, oh, this is delicious. I love this. That's great. Um, okay. Uh, so, all right. I got the origin story, which is yeah. what I, they were the only thing I was really after. So good night. No. Um, <laughs> so now I want to, I want to get to like your process. So I asked you earlier if I could play your set from uh, Corden a couple of years ago. It's, just, it's a couple of minutes. It's a beautifully constructed set. So I want everybody to see it. And then I wonder if we could talk about it. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pretend that I even know how my toaster works and actually try to share the screen. So here we go, I'm, okay. So it's, uh, everybody tell, tell me if you're seeing uh, the screen with the YouTube video, give me a, a thumbs up, are you seeing that? Yeah. I think we can see it. Yeah, you can see it? Yeah. Yep. It's really, really great because I, I can't see it to start it. So let me see if I can find it. Okay, here it is. All right. So I'm going to play this. Make, make sure you can uh, hear it. And Why do you have a tab open that says how to make a homemade bomb? What is that? <laughs> I knew I should have closed those tabs. <laughs> here we go. All right. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Applause break city. Oh man. <laughs> when you look at that, when you look at that, what do you what do you see, Ian? A mustache. I see very little <laughs> else. All I see is the mustache I had. Do you I mean, <laughs> is it like football when you were running football plays and you, you watched films? Do you ever go back and look at your sets and and you know, dissect them or is it pretty much gun and run and you're done? I I listen. I record every stand-up set I do and I and I listen to it right afterwards because I think um, with TV, it's a little bit different. You know, with TV, you kind of have a, you know, what you, I mean, you have to send literally what you're going to say to the network so they can vet it and okay it. Right. Um, so it's like a pretty like rehearsed thing, but every other time I perform, uh, you know, in clubs or like if you're just doing a stand-up comedy at a bar or an open mic or whatever, uh, I find at least with stand-up, it's, best to be like loosely off book like know what know what punchlines you're trying to get to and let your brain sort of figure out other ways to get to those points i've come up with some of my best bits while working towards the punchline that three months later wasn't even in that joke so interesting when, when i write when i write stand up especially when i started out like the first four or five years when i was doing stand up i would sit down and i would write out stand up uh, like with a pen and a legal pad and what I wrote down would be verbatim what I would go on stage and say. Now that I'm a little deeper into it, I do a lot more improvising on stage, but that was my process. I would, I would write it out verbatim, longhand. I would memorize it um, 
and then go up on stage and invariably you would sort of forget how you were getting to punchlines and then you would like sort of come up with new ways and I would use some of those improv instincts and also just like trust myself knowing like I'm a pretty funny guy so let me just try to figure out a new way to do this um and it occurred to me that like I came up with my best stuff while being loosely memorized so then I would start doing that on purpose uh mm -hmm. I'm, my only other encounter with uh, someone of your species was when I was working with uh, Richard Lewis and I was doing a sitcom with him. We were actors in the sitcom and it was multiple cameras. So we'd shoot during the week. And I, I just want to tell you this quickly because it relates to the question I want to ask you. All during the week, Richard would be walking around with this damn index card and, every, you know, and he'd be, you know, scribbling on it and mumbling out loud to himself. And finally, I just said, you know, you got to show me what's on this card and tell me what this is about. And he showed it to me and it was just like fragments of sentences. <laughs> and, and, you know, they're certainly not punchlines or certainly not, not full realized jokes, but just ideas. And, he, and I asked him what it was and he said, well, that's my, the beginning of my process. And then I take that and I would turn the things that are most interesting on, this, on the cards I produce into jokes. And then I would go out into the clubs and I would test this stuff in clubs, hone it up. And when I got my f best 15 minutes, it would be Letterman and then I'd burn it on Letterman and then you'd have to start all over again. So yeah. I, I guess my question is, do, does any of that resonate with you? And is, that, is, is it still the club scene that tests your stuff out? Well, I mean, think now, like, it, some of that does resonate with me. It's definitely, I mean, like, the, the part of it where you take something and cultivate it and cultivate it and cultivate it, and then you try to do it on TV, and then the next day you're left feeling very hollow and empty rather than <laughs> accomplished because it's like, it's like a very, not this, to compare it to postpartum depression minimalizes postpartum depression. Really? It's like a feeling of, like, I've, I've lived with this stuff for so long, and then, like, you get it out and then it's like, you, I don't know. And then it's like, oh, shit, I'm back at square one. It's like right, this right. comedic version of it. And then uh, you feel kind of empty. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I think one of the good things about now and this, you know, cause I just don't want to like, this is true of stand up, and this is true of every form of entertainment. You know, uh, there was a time when like getting on Carson or getting on Letterman as a stand-up comedian was like the biggest thing you could do. And now media has become so fractured, you know what I mean? To the point right. where I know people now who had like, you know, like their own sitcom who, where there was a time where if you had like a sitcom that was on for a few years, you're like, you were, you had it made. Now maybe it was on TBS. Maybe it only ran, maybe there were only eight episode seasons, you know, and like, right. right then you made enough money to live for a few years, but not enough that you're like in your pool. Uh, right. You know, waiting for like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or whatever. So there's a, there's a good side and a bad side of that. It's, it's fractured. There's so many more places that will make your stuff. Uh, there's, there's so many more places that will, that like will put your stuff out. And there's so many different ways to reach a smaller audience, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is it's harder to be a, a part of the like monoculture, if there even is a monoculture, you know what I mean? There's like, right. there might not be, who's the biggest stand-up comedian in the world right now? It's like maybe Kevin Hart, you know, it's, but whoever they are, they're never going to be as famous as Eddie Murphy was, you know? Right, right. Um, the good part of that is, and I've experienced this myself, is like, it, you know, as a stand-up comedian, I've been in a writer's room for the last six years, first on Chelsea Lately and now on uh, Corden, and I've been, like, behind the scenes. But I've also had, like, a podcast that I've been able to do, and, like, you know, that reaches, like, 30,000 people a week or whatever. And then I have been able to do, like, a set on Corden and a set on, you know, co a couple on Conan. I've been able to do a little Netflix thing. I was on Comedy Central for a second, so... And this is true of stand-up, and I think in a larger way, too, no matter what it is you're getting into, it's going to be a lot more piecemeal, your journey to making it a career, I think. Now, and I, I think this has always been the case, but now there's so many different outlets that you can get your stuff out on um, and reach an audience and sort of cultivate that audience yourself. Like, it's exciting as much as it is limiting. 
Now, just to take that set that we just saw, I mean, that's clearly your A stuff. And you, you know, you didn't walk out on that stage cold, I'm assuming. That, that's stuff that you knew where it was going to land. So I guess my question is, how did you know it was going to land? What, what, were, what, were the, what was the process you went through to make sure that you were confident that that stuff was, I mean, was it the, were you writing for Corden at the time that you did that set? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Was the room your, you know, you have like the most fertile people on earth there. Was the room the people you bounced that off of? Or how did you get I here? I wish. That no, there, there's two such different like, Beast, I would never, I, I mean, uh, I love my writers and I really, I think they're wonderful and I respect them and I think they could help my stand up a lot. But like, I mean, we have our own, I mean, we have to write that show, you know, when we're there. So there's like very little time right. for that kind of stuff. And also, I mean, stand, like stand up and late night writing are two different things, but it's like anything, like, you know, it's, it's, it's just repetition. Like, whether it's writing scripts or it's doing stand up or whatever it is, like for stand up, people want to know how you can get better. And I wish there was some secret. All it is is watch as much as you can, perform as much as you can, write as much as you can, and repeat that. And I found that to be true with sketch writing and with, you know, if I've written pilots and stuff like that, it's been, it's just been about repetition. And like to get a set ready for late night, it's, there were jokes in that set that are, uh, that were like four years old and there were jokes in that set that were like a month old. Like, so that soap bit was like a new thing I had just thought of while I was like at my girlfriend's apartment using her shower. <laughs> and I was like, oh damn, 70s like apricot scrub. This is like, <laughs> A, it looks delicious. It smells amazing. And it says apricot on the bottle. And then I would like, if I used, like if I was at my buddy's house and I'd use his shower, I'm like picking up an ax body, you know, and it literally, it's like, our, they're all like military nickname. They're like Gatorade, Body Wash, and f Warheads all have like the same pool of names that they draw from. Um, so was that then, so you got that gag and you're thinking about it in the shower. Is that then something you go out and you club tested when you played like dates here? Or absolutely. I would, well, I mean, as a comedian, my, like one of my great luxuries is like all my family's in Portland. So I get to fly back home and then do all like the little, there's like, shows all over the place. There's shows like at Mississippi Pizza, you know, there's shows at like uh, Eastburn. There's just little like comic run shows all over the place that are somewhere between an open mic and a club. But also a lot of people go to comedy clubs, not no. they just like, let's go see a comedy show. Right. But like if a group of people are showing up to like Mississippi Pizza to see like a bunch of Portland comics putting on a show, you know there's going to be a pretty, like a certain kind of aesthetic which is like kind of nice you like you're going to connect with your audience more but uh short answer yes i ran it as many times as i could and once you've been on tv a couple of times you can like just be like hey i've got a set coming up can you get me up and then i see people put you up when they're like yeah here's five here's five here's five you do as many shows as you can repetition so the process is really pretty much the same as it was for Richard in that, except that, you you know, it's not just Letterman anymore, but I mean, it is that it, the stuff gets tested in clubs and honed and, and edited and rewritten until you feel it's ready. Absolutely. With stand up, if there's, there's still no, the, fu the funniest person writes stuff that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. the, the difference is, I mean, absolutely. Some people are more gifted than other people. John Mulaney, Tiffany Haddish, these are like supernaturally funny people, right? But the biggest difference and something you can carry into, I mean, if like entertainment is a field you want to get into and whether it's writing movies or whatever, like the biggest thing you could do is to work hard. And I know that's like a f bummer thing to say, like, <laughs> or, it's, almost like it's like eye rolling, like how obvious it seems, but like, there were people who were funnier than me in Portland. There were a lot of people who were like funnier than me not a lot, but like, that's lying. But like, there were definitely stand-up comedians as funny or funnier than me when I was starting out in Portland. And even when I was like, towards the top of the Portland comedy scene before I moved to Los Angeles, the difference is the work you put in. You have, you have to, you have to. There is no substitute for it. It's, you have to, tr like, again, this is like a hacky thing to say and how obvious it almost seems, but like, if you want it to become a job, you have to treat it like one before it is one. 
That's the only way. That or if your dad is also famous. Those are the only two ways. Uh, indeed. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you quickly about assembly for a second because it, you know, it occurred to me in watching that and I saw it this afternoon and then um, just saw it again that it, it's almost like a three act play that set. Um, you know, you open with like kind of introducing yourself, you do your mustache bit, the pizza bit, and then, you know, you move into act two, which is relationship talk and the soap bit. And, you know, it's much, it's very personal. And then in act three, you're doing this wonderful kind of set piece of, you know, like a pantomime and it's, it's less personal. It's very, it's political. It's, it's, you know, hard hitting, very funny finish. When you were assembling that, because you said some of those jokes were like four years old, were yeah. you, are, is that something you had to deliberately in mind or just a jerk like me comes along and goes, look, it's a three act play. I mean, <laughs> do you think about that stuff or how do you assemble that set? It's a, it's a little bit of both. I mean, it is like a three act play, but then also you're a jerk. I mean, those two things. Both <laughs> well, everyone will agree. Thumbs up if you agree. <laughs> this guy's no, a jerk. <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. It's like, so the, what I found like, and I think you'll probably agree with this, like in screenwriting as well, like uh, the two most important things, we were lucky enough. We had a, at my, at my job, we have like little Zoom meetings on Fridays where we'll get speakers. And Richard Curtis, who wrote Four Weddings and a Funeral and Notting Hill came on and said something that resonated with me and I think is true of the stand-up thing as well. The two most important things, how you start and how you finish, mm. and how you start isn't even that important. I, know, I don't think if that part's true, but how you start and how you finish oh. in stand-up are so important. Like, I came out with like jokes that were sort of about my appearance and like quick little hits. Here's a little thing about my mustache. People are noticing it. Um, let me tell like a little joke about it. You want to get them laughing quickly. You want to sort of build up a line of comedic credit with an audience. Uh, so you're like, okay, here's a little bit about me. Let me talk about myself, introduce myself to you. So we're a little bit more comfortable, get them laughing quickly. And then you can transition into that uh, soap stuff. It's still a little bit more personal, um, but it takes like a little bit longer to lay out them like the mustache joke and like the doing like a, a crazy Italian accent, which it's, it's funny, but it's not that clever. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But it's going to get them laughing and it's going to sort of like bypass any sort of thought thing and just make you laugh in your lizard brain. <laughs> the same way we've always been laughing at like an Italian chef, like tossing a pizza since we were kids. Um, and then you do the relationship stuff. You introduce yourself a little bit more. You can take a little more time with the jokes. And by the time I got around to the political stuff, which doesn't always go, which doesn't always go well, even if it's like, I'm not really attacking the person, like the man's policies or anything like that in the joke. I'm just talking about how he's like a guy who like f himself over by like <laughs> right. blowing up his own incredibly evil policies. Even still, like I did a show in uh, Humboldt County in Northern California where I thought like, making fun of Trump would be totally okay, but it was at a winery in Northern California and it was full of Trump people. And I told that joke and like, they started booing me and yelling at me and like, you're in the wrong place. Like that kind of shit. I'm like, I'm just talking about how he tweets this shit. Like you, it's just a fact, he does it. Anyway, um, but in that shorter set, you build yourself up credit, you build yourself up credit, you build yourself up credit. So then by the time you get to a joke, forget that it's political a joke that involves like 30 to 45 seconds without me even talking, they think I'm funny so I can get away with trying something a little bit more, um, I guess, hard risky, or, yeah, yeah. risky, hard hitting, yeah. Hard hitting, yeah, I could do something a little more political because they trust me and think I'm funny and I've introduced myself, they know me, they feel like we're friends a little bit. And then they also think I'm funny so I can get away with doing like a 45 second pantomime. <laughs> which is great by the way i'm Thanks, surprised man. you didn't take those uh, acting classes from cj because that, <laughs> that was good i give you a i, I give you a highly proficient on your uh, pantomime thank you it would have been on colbert if i had taken those cj classes instead i got bumped back an hour and a half <laughs> well um there are a couple uh, questions that came up from the class that i find interesting and i just thought i'd throw them out to you one of them was is there is there a place that it's too far for you to go as far as telling a joke? Is there a line you won't cross? Um, 
It's an, it's an interesting question and one that like the entire time I've been doing comedy has been like a big conversation in comedy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I almost look at comedy now, like there's no, I don't think there's any problem with censorship in comedy because you see some of the comedians who have been like, uh, who've like cried foul. Like you have your like, Jerry Seinfeld is like, I can't perform at colleges anymore. You know, like Anthony Jeselnik will be, like be worried he can't go far, although he never complains about it, to be fair. The big, the comedians who do push boundaries and push buttons have massive careers. That's all Louis C.K. did. People want to act like maybe he got like muzzled because he was going too far. That's not it. It's because he jacked off in front of people without their permission. Like, <laughs> that'll do it. The fr- you, there's, there's Amy Schumer, you know what I mean? Like half of her jokes were about like f***ing people or whatever, you know what I mean? And that's, and they're hilarious. I don't think there is a too far you can go, and I don't think people are being really censored. The way I look about content is almost the way like you look at like who has the ability to file a lawsuit. Like I could I could come up with something that I think is like really funny about like what black women go through. You know what I mean? But like who the f- wants to hear it from me? You know what right. I mean? Like right. that's not I don't have standing. I don't like what 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 experience do I have to draw from to talk about that? I don't. Why would I even th- talk about it? That's my own personal point of view. So like when people like say you can't do rape jokes, right? I don't think that's true at all. I think like a guy should maybe not do rape jokes, but I think if a woman wants to talk about what it's like to live with like the constant fear of like where like I can't walk down a I can't like walk down a a street alone like after like I go to a bar with my friends, you know, and they have some funny joke about that. Absolutely you can. You can absolutely do a rape joke, but do you have standing to do a rape joke? Are you speaking from personal experience? You know, so that's my personal point of view. It's not a point of view you can put onto anyone else. It's just sort of the way I see things and like how I what like where I come from comedically. So like my great, you know, I'm the descendant of Holocaust survivors. So I had jokes. I got, I remember when I was on Chelsea lately, Germany had just won the World Cup. And uh, we were talking about it on the panel. And I told a joke that was like, I'm happy for the Germans. I think it's nice that they have something gold that they didn't rip out of my grandmother's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and it got a laugh on the panel. The audience laughed. Chelsea laughed. And I got a letter from the Anti Defamation League. <laughs> that I still have framed somewhere saying like they want me to apologize for the joke and like, and this is from the group who's there to like look out for Jews. You know what I mean? I'm like, I am a Jew. I get to talk about this stuff. I feel like I have standing on it. My dad sees things differently. He doesn't think I should laugh about or joke about the Holocaust ever, but that was really more a joke about the Germans than the Holocaust. But anyway, that's, a, I hope that's not too convoluted an answer. No, no, it's a, it's a very clear answer and it's kind of, uh, you know, I guess it's, it, it's it's kind of the Mel Brooks answer, which is you know he he gets to do springtime for Hitler. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and speaking of Mel Brooks, he once said that um, he, he told a friend of mine that uh, with everything he does, no matter how absurd it is, he always feels that you should be able to to have a thread that you can trace back to something real. The, is that something that resonates with you? It does. It does resonate me. I think even in the most absurd, like Tim and Eric, or I mean, Eric Andre, like whoever's doing the most like absurd comedy right now, there is, however many filters they put it through, something you can follow back to like a shared human experience. You know, there's, there's something about that. Like, I don't know what it is all the time, but I do feel like if something is making you laugh, it's because it's somehow true. Like, in some way it's somehow true and it somehow makes the feeling of being human feel like less isolating and alone, you know? I do. Yeah. And you know, we've kept you here for 45 minutes and I, I, I feel that you need to be able to go to work tomorrow so that I can get my pension. <laughs> so I, I think it's fair we let you go, but um, I wanna, if you have like two more minutes, I wanna just take maybe one or two questions if we haven't covered it. I will answer as many questions as you guys feel like sticking around for. I'm all good. Do you, do you um, does anybody have a question? If you do, raise your hand. Jesse, go ahead, unmute yourself and go. Hey, uh, I was just wondering, um, 
with the the rise of uh, YouTube, is there more uh, of a sort of pressure to write things that are um, expected to go viral versus things that you just find might be a little like wacky or fun? Yeah, there abs there absolutely is a late night. Like we our show like we've had an edict since day one is that like we don't air at 1237 it's we become available at 1237 and in doing so and also thanks to carpool karaoke we became like the most watched late night show on youtube um but yeah i mean some of the funniest stuff we've done on our show has like 240,000 views and you know and then you'll have like oh jason derulo just happened to hop into this car with james so then it has you know, 50 million views on YouTube because people want to hear a different, you know, version of whatever song that was. And there is, that's, that's part of the gig now. The problem is you can't really, outside of putting a celebrity in something, know what's going to become viral or not. So it ultimately kind of just boils down to trying to make the best thing possible again, you know? Um, that's that's still the same thing. Like the, the ways to make something viral all the time are like, can we can we drop a Hemsworth into it? Yes, it's probably gonna be viral. No, maybe it's not gonna be viral. But but that is part of the job. As a late night writer, you're more of a cook than a chef a lot of the time. I mean, you can come up with stuff, but like you do have to know like you you're you're cooking for a certain audience. And part of that is like people are gonna watch on YouTube and share it and stuff like that. Great. Uh, thank you. And another thank question. You. Uh uh, Annika? Hi. Um, I just was wondering if you had any advice for people um, who want to break into television in Los Angeles. Yeah, so it's 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 tough. I, I do have advice, but I also was a stand-up comedian, which is how I which is how I kind of broke into television, which is a uh, you know, sort of an atypical path for doing it. Um I would say if like, this is true, no matter what sort of entertainment you're, thing you're trying to break into, don't be afraid to ask for opportunities. Like, I know that's a very, I don't know, like, you just, if, you, if you are liking what you're writing, if you're working hard and you're working on your craft, like, don't be afraid to ask your like, you know, teacher being like, you know anyone I can talk to down there? Do you know any like showrunners who might be able to get me like a PA job? Because it's very likely you're gonna like, climb a ladder, you know, unless you make your own shit, if you're like Issa Rae and like, you know, make your own thing and that blows up on YouTube and then somebody at HBO gives you like a contract, which might happen. You should absolutely make your own thing. But like a lot of the time you end up like as a PA who then gets moved to a writer's assistant who then becomes like a junior writer and then a staff writer and then a story producer. And a lot of that gets kicked off by saying, I like what I'm doing. I'm going to ask for an opportunity. And I know that can be so hard, but one of the best things you can do for yourself is being like, I believe in what I've written. The worst thing they can do is say no. I'm gonna ask for an opportunity. Um, follow, figure out who writes for the TV shows you like, follow them on Twitter, bother us on Twitter. You know what I mean? Again, the worst thing they can do is mute you. So f it. so what, you know? They'll unmute you when you're a showrunner. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like. <laughs> So, so ask, and I know that's a hard thing to do. And it's also a very like white male privilege thing to be just ask. That's the easiest way. But like Siri, go in and ask rattle cages a little bit. And a lot of the time you'll get people to respond. Uh, Grant, you had a question. Go ahead, buddy. You're muted, Grant. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no, got it. Um, so hi. Um, so I was, well, I am con was a professional stand-up comedian before the whole world blew up and that's totally <laughs> my entire income source but um but so i'm i'm but i really want to write uh, sitcoms and i was curious if you uh, attribute your success in stand-up comedy to your success in television uh i mean definitely the stand-up comedy led directly to my first writing job like i got my first writing job by doing stand-up comedy at the just for last festival in montreal as a new face um which is that for, that's just basically like the NBA draft for comedians every year. They pick like 14 people and then you get like wined and dined by managers or whatever. And then yada, yada, yada. Um, but yeah, it's stand-up comedy led me directly to the writing jobs. It was, I wasn't sending in packets. I wasn't like 
doing any of that. It was just like the right person saw me doing stand-up comedy. Okay, and um, did, when you got that first writing job, did you feel um, a little bit behind everybody who had gotten it through other means or? Honestly, I, 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 I kind of didn't. I mean, like the people who run these shows aren't, you know, well, some of them are stupid, but for the most part, they're not stupid. Like yeah. they think you are funny and they're gonna bring you in and like try to coach you up and like get you up to speed. Like, I know that's what we do. I'll hire, like, there'll be people who have better packets that we'll read who I like, maybe they have more ideas that are like ready to put on TV, but this person B has like a packet that's just like funnier. It just has funnier stuff in it. And oftentimes, like if we have a strong room, I'll hire person B so we can like take a chance on somebody who has really bold, innovative ideas. I don't think, I didn't feel far behind on it. Now, as far as sitcom writing goes, because I've worked only in late night, other than I had a pilot uh, with ABC that we made and everything, it didn't go, whatever. But um, that's another thing where write as much as you can and read as much as you can. The more like, and like there's some amazing, I mean like watch the Modern Family first episode, like watch the uh, like Broad City's first episode. Like there's some amazing like pilot episodes that do such a good job of introducing characters and introducing tone and theme. Like, you want to watch as many of those as possible. And especially ones that, like, don't, like, if you're like, I would never do a show like Modern Family, then especially watch Modern Family. You know yeah. what I mean? Let's take from it what you can. Thank you. Great. Yeah. yeah. Th thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Ian, have you gone into uh, any, any sitcoms room as a punch-up guy, like one day a week? Um, I did, well, it's not a sitcom. I did like a lot of punch up on Sasha Baron Cohen's last thing, the America thing. Uh, that was really fun. A lot of, like just a lot of room work and a lot of punch up. Um, and I've done punch up on every movie Corden's done, but never on a sitcom per se. Looking at, looking for hands. Uh, Kevin. Yeah. Um, so your society started about 10 years ago, I should know it's in a huge amount of time. But would yeah. you do anything differently between now and then if you're starting up right now? I would have, I mean, honestly, and this is like, I don't know how good of advice this is, but like, I've, I went from like ha having my own career. I got used to the money basically. And I don't know if I would have done that if I could, but again, like if I could go back, I'm sure I would because like, I like having health insurance, but yeah. like, it's nice, isn't it? It's really, <laughs> It's really fucking nice, especially when you eat like I do. But um, <laughs> I, 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 I maybe would have taken more chances. And like part of this is like now I'm the head writer of a late night show and I work like 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week sometimes. So there's not a lot of time to go back and work on like, oh, this pilot I really wanted to get going. Or like, oh, I wish I would have shot a web series or something like that. There was definitely a time for that in my career. And I kind of like zoomed past it. I can still write pilots, but like, I would have experimented more. I think I would have like tried more auteurish comedy stuff and less sort of cooking for other people. Okay. And the nice thing about where y'all are at right now is you're absolutely in a place where you can sort of experiment and do more like stuff that comes directly from your point of view. And I think that's like a really good thing to do. Now I had that with stand up, um, and I don't think I really would have done anything different with like my beginning first five years of stand up. But like, once I got the writing jobs, I just got so used to having like a place to be in a steady paycheck. And that can be, it can be like velvet handcuffs. It certainly can be, so. Yeah, it's like the guys who, you know, did one show for nine seasons. And that's really great. You know, I was talking to some old timer who used to be in one of our rooms as a punch up guy. And like Bob was, you know, like go, went back to Lucy. And he said that in those days before the guild made you have staff writers, there weren't staff writers. Yeah, said, you know, I would write a bonanza one week and then the next week I'd be writing Star Trek and then the next week I'd be writing, you know, where's my hat or whatever. Yeah. And, and he said it was it was terrifying because you didn't know where your next job was, but it was also liberating in a way because you got all you, you just didn't get stale. So, it, yeah, know, there's, always, I, I, there's always the danger, of, of course, of that. But, you know, it's a job. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's certainly, it's a thing where there's no right answer. It's, it's a grass is greener thing. It's like completely, it would be fun to take more chances, but also it's nice to like, you know, like yeah. 
right. no, I'm going to be able to pay rent next month as, as, a, as an artist, which is weird. Yeah, and you know, baby needs shoes, so you do, you know, that's yeah, part of the bail money. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but you know, in in a late night, I imagine you you have a lot more. Uh, you know, it's topical. It's uh, you know, there there's probably a lot more to keep you interested than in writing for the same characters week in and week out. So there's oh a, yeah, there's a blessing in that. It's certainly, and with somebody like Corden who can do anything you throw in front of him. I mean, like. One week he's jumping out of a plane with Tom Cruise. The next he's doing a desk bit. The next he's like in a car singing. So it is fun. It's like he's an old song and dance man, basically. So anything you can throw in front of him, he can execute, which is nice as a writer. Fun. Okay, last question. Who's got one? Uh, Tiffany. Hi. So as someone who's an actor and a screenwriter, uh, for uh, if you write a sitcom or whatever, do actors have a say? in certain lines that maybe you wrote or uh, is that mostly just directors and stuff like that? Or do they get feedback to you? Well, I think, uh, Corden certainly does. I mean, like, <laughs> it's on late night, yeah. I mean, like, I, speaking of Mel Brooks, I got to write a sketch for Mel Brooks and Corden, which was like the highlight of my life. But like That's halfway awesome. through it, he's like, nothing in this sketch makes sense. And then they both started <laughs> ripping. And like, I was never happy to have someone make fun of my, more happy to have someone make fun of shit I wrote. But like, um, it depends. It depends. Everything's about like, who's got the juice? You know what I mean? If there's somebody, if it's like a big actor and they don't want to say your lines, they're going to be like, go rewrite this. So if it's a big star, yeah, they have like full control over what they will or won't say. If it's more of a work a day actor, they'll probably say it because they don't want to get fired from the set, you know? And then there's certain, like, if you're Aaron Sorkin, probably they're going to say what you write for him, you know? It just depends on where you're at on the totem pole. And remember, remember also, Tiffany, that a lot of, in, in the scripted world, a lot of uh, star actors are also producers and executive producers. So, you know, as a schmuck in the room, you're working for them. So even though you might be an executive producer showrunner, they're, they've got as much juice as you, and they're the ones that can go, as Ian said, to hide out in their, you know, green room or trailer and not come out, so... Indeed. Right. Listen, I want to thank you so much for doing this, Ian. This was a blast. Yeah, it's, my pleasure. It's really nice of you to come in, especially since you're still a working Steph. And, and I'm, I'm I'm happy to do it. It was this or playing Animal Crossing for six hours while like a Ken Burns documentary plays in the background. So I'll do that right after. <laughs> Excellent. There's still time. The yeah. evening is the evening is young. Give give Ian a round of applause. Unmute and let's let's hear thunderous applause for. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real. Thank you, buddy. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime, anytime. And if anybody has any more questions, it's just add Ian Carmel on Twitter. Hit me up, and I'll try to answer whatever I can if it all comes up. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You've been very generous. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Good night. Have fun. Be yourself. Work hard. That's all you can do.